what man means for evil, God intends for good. That when man thinks they've won, God's the one who's actually laughing because God is the victor even over suffering and death. And that there is no absence of God amidst your suffering. Well, this morning, we have officially hit the midpoint in the Gospel of Mark. Woohoo! All right, cool. Uh, we have officially hit the midpoint mark, and I love how Mark is structured. It is so beautifully structured because the midpoint is Mark's high point in his gospel. This morning, we're going to see a radical shift. It's like part one and now part two, because Mark is going to totally reorient our focus and narrow us in on this one thing that we're going to talk about this morning. And what Mark has been dealing with for the first eight chapters of his gospel is this one idea. Who is Jesus? He wants us to ask that question. Who is Jesus? If you remember back to chapter three, the storm comes, the disciples panic, and Jesus calms the storms, calms the wind, calms the waves. And what do his disciples ask? Who is this man? But even before that, all the way back to chapter one, if you remember, Jesus has that run in with that demon and that demon says what? He says, you are Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God. And what does Jesus say? Shut up and come out of him. And the crowds were amazed because they said, what is this? A teaching with authority. The whole question we've been getting at is, who is Jesus? If you remember two weeks ago, we came and we saw this leaven, the unbelief of the Pharisees, and we noticed one amazing thing, that unbelief had spread to the disciples. And this is what we realize, that proximity without understanding is a recipe for disaster. That in the kingdom of God, and when we think that we are close to Jesus just because we have proximity by doing good moral things and no understanding of who our king is, that is disastrous for our lives. Proximity without understanding will keep us stagnant in our walk. Proximity without understanding will harden our hearts, making us think we are able and we are good enough and we don't need a savior. Proximity without understanding will never cause us to cling so tightly to our king when troubled waters in our lives come. And then last week, Seth did a great job with those few little tiny verses of Jesus healing that blind man. And this was a picture that, I love how Jesus uses us as sermon analogies, by the way. Has anyone ever just loved that about their lives? Like everything we go through is a sermon analogy for the glory and the majesty of God. And this blind guy last week was a sermon analogy for the disciples. Because if you remember two weeks ago, the disciples were confused. They're worried about what? Where's the bread? Where's the bread? And Jesus is like, you're missing the point. And then we saw, Seth saw, showed us last year that understanding does not come from in the kingdom of God through memorization. It does not come through intellectual ascent. Understanding in the kingdom of God does not come through white knuckle discipline of doing, 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 and doing. Understanding comes when our Lord and Savior grabs us and opens the eyes of our hearts to see the glory and the majesty and the greatness of God. And this is good news, that Jesus doesn't knock at the door of our hearts and say, can you let me in? But he busts down the doors of our hearts and says, I am here to make my, for myself a holy people. Amen. And what we see last week is it's going to take multiple times of Jesus continually opening the eyes of the hearts of his disciples so that they may see clearly who he is and praise God because that's your life and my life, is it not? I always say it the same way. I am terrified of people who spend decades in church and are no different over decades of repeated teaching of the word of God. 
The whole point of preaching is to do what? To comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. And so, man, when we come into the presence of Jesus, man, we are called into great, great things. And this is good news. And then so what we see is in the human condition, in your life and my life, we have pointed out time and time again where we have found ourselves way too easily satisfied with the things of this world. We have found ourselves way too easily satisfied with the things that have no power to resurrect the dead heart that we once had. And Jesus calls us into greater things than that. And so what do we do? We behold the glorious riches of Christ, the glory of God, this idea that this infinite God, and we realize how small and tiny we are, this infinite God loves us despite how wicked and tiny we are. The great gospel that God chose us to be in him before the foundations of the world. He adopted us. He set us apart. He is making us holy. And he will one day glorify us all into eternity to spend time with him. And this morning we get to see, we get to see this great truth when the disciples, it finally clicks in their heart. This great announcement of understanding who Jesus is. And yet, just like the blind man last week, their eyes are open a little bit, but they still don't see clearly because they need more teaching, more understanding. And so this morning, we're going to see Jesus' great plan for his church amidst a wicked world. This morning, we get to see what Jesus declares as victory and it will shock us. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 is going to be our text this morning. Uh, Mark chapter 8 will be our big shift in the gospel of Mark. We're going to go from Jesus teaching the disciples about who he is to now he is going to shift teaching what Jesus has come to do. He has come to teach, and now he is shifting, and he's saying, I have come to be the suffering servant. And he calls his disciples, he calls the disciples, you and me to a life of discipleship. The call to follow Christ is not a call to raise a hand, to pray a prayer, to walk the aisle, to get dunked, to show up to church, to put some money in the plate. The call of discipleship is the call to die. And the call of discipleship is a call to live in the glories and the riches and the majesties of God and beholding his glory and saying, that is my treasure. You can have the world. I'll take that. And that's what the call of discipleship is. The call of discipleship is the recognition that you and I have only one life to live. And we can live our lives one of two ways. One way we can live our lives is for our glory, our majesty, our kingdom, building up our self, knowing that the second we die, it'll all pass away. Or... We can live our lives so that God's name may be seen amidst all things and everything we do. That call that we can lift and exalt Christ and it will never be put to shame. And God calls us to put to death some things in our life that we hold most dear, doesn't he not? And far too often, far too often, do you and I believe that lie from the serpent in Genesis 3, hey Eve, do you know why God told you not to eat of that tree? Because he's keeping power from you. He's keeping stuff from you because he doesn't want you to be great. Far too often in our lives do we view our walk in obedience like that. God's restricting me because he doesn't want good things from me. And what do we realize over and over and over again? What God restricts so that we may grow in faith with him. This is the promise of Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Joy is missing when we are not walking with our Savior. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. 
Is your joy found in you walking with Christ? Are your anxieties found for the things of this world? So we're going to see this very deep call of God, this call that begs us and bids us to come and die so that we may live. The old Scotty's got to die so that Christ can be glorified in my life. May that be so of us this morning. And so before we take a look at this great, deep call in our lives, let us pray together. Would you pray with me? Father, you are the Father of all. God, your word says that you know what we need before we even know we need it that you know what we're going to pray for even before we pray for it, but that you delight in the prayers of your people, a sweet aroma to your nose. And so, Father God, we ask that the preaching and teaching of God's word be a delight to you in this worship time. Now, church, let's just pray for me. Pray that I'll be helpful this morning. Pray that I'll speak clearly. Pray that God will hide me behind and beneath his cross and lift up his son this morning. Now, church, let's just pray for yourself. Pray that God will open up your ears, your heart, your mind to hear from him this morning, that he'll remove distractions, and that he will fill your heart with the joys of his gospel. Father God, this time is yours. We pray these things because of your son's atoning work on the cross, your spirit that's alive and active within all who believe. Amen. Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27 through 30. This is the word of the Lord. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. So Jesus takes a nice little walk north, about a 25-mile walk north, to ask one question. Jesus has taken his disciples into many interesting, many fascinating places, but I would argue Caesarea of Philippi might be the most fascinating, might be the most interesting of all places Jesus would ever take his disciples So what is the deal with Caesarea of Philippi? Caesarea of Philippi sat at the most northern point of Israel. It's as far north as you could go. It's on the border of Israel. And this is where immense, immoral, polytheistic religion was practiced by the Romans. It was a place of incredible immorality. It was a place of incredible polytheistic religion, worshiping many, many gods. It was a place where the Romans would often go to worship their gods. And here is why it was immoral, because what sat at the center of this religion, this polytheistic religion, was what you know as, from Matthew chapter 16, the gates of hell. And at the gates of hell was a big old cliff, and you would walk to the top of the cliff, and beneath you on this cliff was a river that ran into this cave below you. And this is where many sacrifices would take place. Usually they were animals, but often, but there was also sometimes when human sacrifices would take place. Children being thrown from the top of the cave down into this water. And what it was, was when you threw the sacrifice over, if you saw blood, it meant that the gods accepted your sacrifice. But if you did not see blood, they rejected your sacrifice. 
And Jesus stands amidst this audacious, horrific worship experience. And he has one question for his disciples. Who do people say that I am? And I want to remind you, Jesus is not trying to find out how popular he is. In a world where we are obsessed with popularity and fame, Jesus never was. In fact, Jesus often recognized the dangers of popularity, fame, and power. We would be, right, we would be wise as a church to recognize the dangers of fame and popularity, especially in a world that's obsessed with fame and popularity. I find it amazing how many people are looking and how many people are excited when that one celebrity becomes Christian. That we're all waiting for that one really smart person to give their lives for Christ. Allow me to remind you that being popular in the kingdom of God is like being prom king of your homeschool. It's not that great of an achievement. Some of you got it. Your neighbor will explain it to you later. It's okay. I want to remind you that Jesus did not go find the most brilliant, the most popular, the most powerful people to follow him. He found the most average of average people, people like you and me. Did he just call me average? Well, if you're not, I'm sorry, I am, and I'm okay to admit it. But you know what Jesus was looking for in his disciples? Not fame, not popularity, not brilliance. Not good, white-knuckle moral discipline, but people who are totally sold out to the glory and the majesty of him. Amen. And that's the church, my friends. This was Peter's cry in John chapter 6. Jesus, where would we go? You have the words of life, and we want to be with you, O oh Lord. Let me tell you, Jesus and God are not looking for that one famous, popular whomever to come and fix this world. Jesus, and pay attention very carefully, Jesus and God are looking to the church because the church is where the glory of God is manifested. God has said, the church is my plan A and I have no plan B for this world. And so if we're waiting for some celebrity, some politician, some someone to come and be our hero, guess what? Our Messiah has already come, and he is one, and he is reigning and ruling. And my dear friends, we must be very careful of looking to fame and popularity to advance the kingdom of God. Because the church is made up of a group of average individuals who are radically sold out to see the glory of God into all four corners of this world. Next, we see Jesus wants his disciples to know who he is. He wants his disciples to understand who he is. My friends, far too often we are obsessed with doing and we neglect the knowing. Far too often do we talk about doing and neglect the knowing. The call to follow Jesus is not blind faith. The call to follow Jesus is to follow him who are disregarding all other empty philosophies and religions of this world. Amen. And this is why Mark has spent literally half of his gospel getting us to ask the question, who is Jesus? And this is the question we need to ask. Who is our Savior? Who is our Lord? Who is our King and so how do we know who Jesus is? Step one, we must know his word. I want to remind you, if we are void of private worship, if we are void of time and worship with just ourselves and Jesus in our prayer closets, in our individual private studies, we will fail to worship him publicly. Without private worship, public worship will be just what it seems, a show, an act. And let me remind you, without private worship, without private worship, the courage to stand up for the glories and the majesties of God in a world that hates him will be absent. Right. If we fail to have a private time with God, we will fail to have a public time with him as well. Because it is in those private times of worship that God builds our faith. Do not neglect your private time of worship. 
Next, we are called to have maturity. Maturity in the kingdom of God comes from knowing Jesus and then walking him out, just like James talked about in our congregational reading. Don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the world. This is why in the church service, this is why the sermons are not about doing, but about beholding the glory of Christ. And so we must not be so concerned with the doing and neglect the knowing. And so here, Jesus asks the question, who do people say that I am? If you notice, the answer that the disciples give are the same answer that Herod's friends gave him back in Mark chapter 6. It's the same order, the same people. John the Baptist, Elijah, and one of the prophets. Here's the glowing problem with that list. All of those people were designed to point to God. And what is, why do those fall short? Because Jesus is God. He not only points to God, but he is God. He is the answer. He is salvation because he is going to be the lamb who was slain. Truly God, truly man. And then Jesus asks the more important question of his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Jesus wants to make sure that his disciples understand who he is. Let me remind you, Jesus is not concerned with public opinion of himself. He's concerned with his church's opinion of himself. And this is the heart of worship. When we're not concerned with changing public opinion about Christ, but rather concerned with worshiping him in spirit and in truth. If we try to change public opinion of Christ, that will be like chasing wind. What the church is concerned is to worship him in spirit and in truth. And Peter answered it perfectly. You are the Christ. Now, what is Christ? So this is where we got to do a little work, right? All right, so we got to do a little work during our sermon. So roll up your sleeves and we need to understand what is the word Christ, Okay. So Christ is not Jesus' last name. We all understand that, right? I hope so. Here we go. Not, I'm gonna, you're gonna, I'm either gonna wow you're gonna hate me. So we'll either one. So here we go. So in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, the major prophet Isaiah, I think, was the most adamant about making us understand this word, the promise of the coming Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. It just means king. It's another way to say king. The king was promised back in Genesis. If you remember in Genesis, we just read this a few months ago, so it should be really fresh on your mind in our reading plan. If you remember back in Genesis, you had the 12 tribes, and one of those tribes was the line of Judah. The king was going to come from the line of Judah. You get to David, and the promise to David in 2 Samuel was there was going to be a king who would sit on the throne forever and ever. The Psalms talked about this king that would come and set Israel free. Isaiah talked about this Messiah who would come and set Israel free. Messiah and Christ are the same words. It's Messiah, Meshiach in Hebrew, Christos in Greek, but they're the same words. Christ in Greek, anointed one. So understand Messiah equals Christ. So when he says you are the Christ, it literally means you are the king. You're the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. You're the promised king of the Old Testament. And why is this amazing? The first time we saw the word Christ in Mark was in Mark chapter 1. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man. We have not seen the word Christ until this moment in Mark chapter 8. So here's what we then therefore realize, that people have not recognized Jesus as the promised Messiah of the Old Testament. Why? Because Jesus wasn't doing things the way they wanted the Messiah to do things. They wanted the Messiah to come in, take care of Rome. Remember, Rome's got their thumb on Israel, enslaved. They've got their thumb on Israel. And they're like, the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, he's going to kick out Rome. He's going to give us back our country. And Jesus wasn't doing that, was he? He actually has not even been concerned with the Romans at all in Mark's gospel. He has come and he's invading the hearts. He's invading, he's invading prostitutes and tax collectors. He is calling and seeking and saving the lost and he is not dealing with the country. 
because he has a greater purpose. And so this is what we realize in our human condition, that we must truly understand who Jesus is. We will always see Jesus as one of two ways, as Messiah or as useful. As useful, we'll see Jesus as someone here to clean up our messes, to answer our requests, to fix our culture, to bring back what we hold most dear. Or we'll see him as Messiah, as King, here to invade the hearts of the people who we come in contact with every day. As king, your prayers will be filled with with you and I crying out, Lord, do whatever you do. Take whatever you have to take. Do whatever you need to do. Send me wherever I need to go into the most darkest and terrible places of the world so that the people may know your name. A useful Jesus will have the five easy steps to the 40 days of whatever, a year of this, the how-to of this. Well, the Messiah Jesus will be the God of all things, through all things, for all things. A useful Jesus, when suffering comes into our life, will cause us to say, as Job's wife did, curse God and die. Well, the Messiah Jesus, when suffering comes, will cause us to say, as Job did, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. A useful Jesus will cause us to worship whenever it's convenient. A Messiah, Jesus, will cause us to worship in all things, in all moments of our lives, a life of worship. A Messiah, Jesus, will have us say the sentiment of the psalmist in Psalm 16, God's people are the excellent ones. They are where I find delight. The Lord is my portion. Translation, God, take whatever you want to take, take the whole world and leave me you and your people. A true Christian finds great joy amidst the people of God. Do you know how messed up the church is, Pastor? Absolutely, because I know how messed up I am. (laughs) Never met a perfect person in the world. And by the way, if you ever find the perfect church, please don't join it because you'll just mess it up. (laughs) I'm begging you don't join that church. I get very concerned in the Christian life when we talk more about doing rather than worshiping. I get very concerned in my own heart when I think I have to rather than, God, I'm so glad I get to serve you by serving blank. And so our man Peter cries out, you are the Christ, you are the king. This is the promise of the scriptures, that the king would come and set his people free. And so we see that time and time again that Jesus says what he does here in verse 30, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. This started all the way back in chapter one. I'm gonna tell you, you go to an evangelistic meeting, no one's gonna use this verse, right, as our evangelistic meeting. (laughs) Tell no one about Jesus, bro. So why does Jesus say, don't tell anyone about me? This started all the way back in chapter one. If you remember the demon, first one, like first human actually, or I mean the first, I guess, entity received the claim, you are Jesus is now there, the Holy One of God. What does Jesus say? Shut up. And then from there, we see Jesus strictly warn people, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone, don't tell anyone. Interesting enough, and this is, I think, the key to understanding this, y'all. Don't miss this. Who did Jesus not strictly warn people to not say anything about him? The Gentiles. Because the Gentiles didn't have a wrong view of king. They had the right view of king. Well, the Jews' view of king was what? He's here to fix the political structure. And so why does Jesus tell his disciples, don't tell anyone this fact? Because Jesus has to fix their theology. Church, I need you to hear me on this. Theology is not just for the pastors and the academics. Theology is for the Christian. Theology matters. What God's word says matters a great deal. And Jesus has to fix their theology before they can become proclaimers. Verse 31 through 33. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed 
and after that three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. I want you, if you're, you have your little marked journals or you're okay in circling in your Bible, circle that word must. The Son of Man must suffer. This must take place. Why must this take place? Because the cross was on the books before the foundations of the world. Before God even laid the first stone in this world, the cross was on the books. The cross was not a reaction to Adam and Eve. It was already proactively on the books before the first sin would take place. In Genesis 3, we see the promise of God to the evil, wicked serpent that from this woman, from her seed, there will be a man and you will bite his heel and he will crush your head. He will destroy your works. And so this is what the Messiah comes to do. He comes to destroy and to set free his people from the slavery of sin. And the only way this can happen is how? Through the road of suffering. And you and I have to love the humility of Mark in this text. Because who is giving Mark all of his information? My man, Simon Peter. If you read Matthew 16, the parallel account to this, Matthew's account of this, Matthew goes into great detail about Jesus' response to Peter. And he says what? Blessed be you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And upon this bedrock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against you. Why is that missing in Mark's account? Because Mark wants you and I to pay attention to the rebuke more than the praise of Jesus. Because this is the central point in Mark, that the Son of Man must suffer. Let me remind you, if Simon Peter was the beginning Pope, Peter clearly did not know that. Because he would have said it right here. Y'all listen to me because I'm the beginning Pope, but he doesn't say that. He pays attention to the rebuke. And then we see in verse 32, and I want you to pay attention to this verse 32. And he said this plainly. I love short little sentences in the Bible that we can so easily run past. Do you realize what what Simon Peter through Mark is saying here? He's saying Jesus was not being cryptic. He wasn't even speaking in parables. He was very, very plainly telling us, I must suffer and we didn't understand it. It was staring us in the face and we did not get it. The purpose of his ministry, the purpose of Jesus' ministry was to be the lamb who would be slain. For Peter, the cross was unthinkable. For Jesus, it was inevitable. Next, I want you to notice that it was not the worst of society. It was not the most immoral of society who Jesus lists here. It was the most moral and religious of people he lists here. It was the people that thought, I'm good enough to be in the kingdom of God. These moral people had no true love for God because their good works were their God. They thought they could earn their way into salvation through works. The most moral of people without the grace of God will always show you how little they understand the gospel by how they preach to God, the gospel to those who do not know Christ. The moral person actually believes they are morally superior to the immoral people. The moral person looks at others and sees them as animals, while the gospel-driven people see them as people made in the image of God who desperately need to know the grace of God to set them free from the slavery that so entangles them. If you do not have grace and mercy like Jesus had on you to the most immoral of people, then my friend, I want to encourage you, you don't know the gospel. I don't like him rebuking me. 
because we have a world that desperately needs to know how Christ has come to set us free. Remember back to earlier in chapter 8, Jesus said what? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. My friends, it was not an out-of-control mob who came to arrest Jesus. It was a very carefully orchestrated plan with arrest warrants in the middle of the night who came for Jesus. It was not the immoral, non-church-going people. It was literally the people that had no desire for the glory of God, just a desire to lift up themselves, lift up their preferences, and lift up their agenda. So why was Peter and the disciples having such a hard time understanding the cross? Jesus says it right here, because they were not setting their mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. They weren't thinking heavenly. They were thinking about this world. The problem is not that they were thinking too big. They were thinking too small. And oh, how this happens in your life and in my life, how we think only about this little, tiny, blue and green marble we live on when there's a great, vast heavens that we are called to live for. And this is your prayers and my prayers. So often we pray, may it never be. We'll come across scriptures in the Bible and we'll be like, that doesn't apply to me. That must apply to someone else. And this is why we must let the word of God mess with our views of this world and of others. Let me remind you, if in your reading plan, if in your quiet time, if in your worship, God does not disagree with you, you are in trouble. The word of God will often disagree with you. Why? Because God is shaping you and shifting you and conforming you into the image of God. If you don't believe me, find someone with gray hair in here and ask them about how God has shaped and shifted their gospel transformation over the decades of their lives. Next, I want you to notice, if you look at verse 31, Jesus, he began to teach. Verse 32 And Peter took him aside, and he began to rebuke. Jesus began to teach, didn't even get through all this teaching, and Jesus started rebuking. So the question we are asking is, why is Peter rebuking Jesus? Because he has some disbelief that needs to be rid of in his own heart. And I want to say this with confidence Our pulpits in our world and our lives do not need more inspiration. We do not need more fancy memes on Facebook and and Instagram. We need transformation and followed by perspiration. We do not need more inspired sermons. We need more biblically transforming sermons followed by perspirating work of the gospel. Our hearts have a tendency to shape Jesus into our personal felt need. And when a rebuke comes from Jesus, we must pay attention to it. We must allow Jesus to rebuke us. And so what is Peter's ultimate rebuke of Jesus? I wish, I want to know what he actually said. I want to know how you start off that conversation, but I want to know that, but that's okay. I'll find out in heaven. And here's what's going on here. Peter is assuming that suffering and the goodness of God are divorced from one another. And this is a problem. This is why doctrine, this is why theology matters. This is at the heart of why Jesus said, I have to teach you about these things. Far too often do we assume that God gives sunshines and not storm clouds in our lives. Far too often do we assume that the good things are from God and the bad things are from Satan when the Bible says the direct opposite. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. He makes rise and he kills. He heals and he sickens. And this is a point all the way back into the book of Genesis. How does Genesis end but a story of one guy, my man, Joseph? And Joseph's brothers, they beat him up, they throw him in a well. He's sold into slavery. He's in slavery for 12 years. Wrongfully imprisoned, by the way, for 12 years. And finally, he comes face to face with his brothers who sold him into slavery. And what is his big response to his brothers? What man means for evil, God intends for good. 
that when man thinks they've won, God's the one who's actually laughing because God is the victor even over suffering and death. And that there is no absence of God amidst your suffering. It's good news for a lot of us. And Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this light momentary affliction is producing in us a glory that far outweighs all comparisons. And this is the question we get so often. If God is good, why is there suffering? If God is good, why am I suffering? If God is good, why am I struggling? And you know the problem with that question, don't you? They're ultimately asking, why do I deserve this suffering? Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, let me give you some scripture. Romans chapter 3, for there is no one good, no, not even one. There was only one time in the history of the world where a bad thing happened to a good person and he volunteered for it. So when we find ourselves like Peter saying, may it never be, Mark is having us reorient our eyes to see the glories of Jesus on that cross. And so what we see here is Jesus is going to walk out faith in the plan of the Father. And the reason why Jesus volunteered for the cross was because he cared more about the glory of God than his own will, his own preferences, and his own comforts. This is faithfulness, being totally sold out for the glory of God in all things in our lives. This is trusting in God, that even through suffering, God's goodness will be clearly seen. Even amidst the worst of circumstances, even amidst the worst moments of our lives, God will will vindicate his people, and God's glory will never be put to shame. And this was God's plan from the beginning. That's Colossians, by the way, before the foundation of the world, crosses on the books, but it's also stated in Isaiah 53. It was the good pleasure of the Father to crush his servants. My friends, the Romans didn't kill Jesus. The Pharisees didn't kill Jesus. God crushed Jesus, and Jesus gave up his life to save his church. Next, we see this is Jesus' declaration on war. This is Jesus going to war. This is Jesus going to battle. And Jesus knew how to win because he knew his enemy and he knew the weapons it would take to win. His enemy was not the religious leaders. His enemy was not Rome. His enemy was not those who wanted him dead. His enemy was not anyone in this like religious scene of Caesarea Philippi. His enemy was Satan who held the keys to sin and death. Jesus' enemy was Satan. And Jesus' weapon was not force and power, but servanthood and suffering. And know this, Jesus had complete control and power over the situation. Jesus, we're going to see from Mark 8 all the way to the end, Jesus is going to march towards the cross. He won't be dragging his feet. He won't be lollygagging. He will be marching like a warrior to the cross. And aren't you glad that Jesus decided to fight with a heavenly perspective, not with your perspective and my perspective? Because, man, I know if I had all the power of God, I would be wrecking havoc on people. But Jesus knew what you and I now know, that without the cross, there would be no salvation. With no salvation, we would still be in our sins. With still in our sins, we'd stand before that judgment seat guilty. And so Jesus knew his enemy and he knew his weapons. This is why Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we fight not against flesh and blood and the principalities of the air or any sort of human group or people, but we fight against the forces of evil. And the one weapon we have, the one offensive weapon we have is what? The word of God, the sword of the Spirit and prayer. That's our one weapon because the word of God is effective in 
cutting bone and marrow down to soul and spirit, causing dead men to rise. That's our one weapon. The church fights not on its feet, but on its knees. And that's how God gets the glory in the church. And this is what we must realize. What is success? If we have a view of success from a human perspective, it will always feel like we're losing in this world. But when we see success from a heavenly perspective, when we see success from a heavenly perspective, we will see how God is conquering the hearts of people over and over and over again. Church, we have a lot to celebrate in this church. If we try to measure success, how the world measures success, we will be like Peter. May it never be. If we look at things from a human perspective, we'll be tempted to cry out, I want to fight with the weapons of the world. And let me tell you, that has never worked well for the church in the history of the world. The church has always flourished when they stand up and they say, do what you have to do to me. My king reigns and rules from heaven. He reigned and ruled from the cross. What you meant for evil, he intended for good, and he will have the last say. So you do whatever you got to do to me, because my king wins. And I want us to see the follow-up of our Lord, verses 34 through 38. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save her. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels." I want us to put this scripture into context. Remember, Mark is being written to a church in Rome and Nero is in charge and Nero has said, let's kill all of the Christians. And so you have soldiers, they're banging down the doors of the homes of Christians, dragging Christians out into the street and they're saying, all right, I'm gonna ask you one question and you're either gonna be put on the cross or you're gonna be able to go back home and live your life. Is Jesus your king? If you say yes, you're going to that cross today. If you say no, you go back home and live your life. And this is a question the church in Rome was asking that that Peter is answering. We're watching our friends be crucified, brutally murdered, and killed amidst this. It doesn't feel like we are winning, Peter. It doesn't feel like we're winning here. How do we win here if that's what's going on in our world? And Peter's reminding us through the words of Jesus, do not think of your life so small as your little 80 years on this little marble but set your eyes on the glories of heaven. Because if you deny Christ, you've denied life in general. Do not deny Christ, for Christ is greater. What life do we have if Christ is absent? There would be no joy. Why? Because the things of this world cannot satisfy us. And for the Christian, they say, give me death. As long as I have Christ, because this death is not the end. And so Jesus calls to us. Again, don't believe me, read the book of Revelation. Look, the king, the lion of Judah. And I looked, and behold, there was a lamb who looked as though it had been slain. Who is to bring a charge against God's church, against God's elect? It's Christ who justifies. It's Christ who died. And it's Christ who says, you are mine. What court could they hold us in? For there is one final court of appeals, and that is the great white throne root of judgment where we can boldly say, I put my whole faith in Jesus. And that's where I live my life. So how do we live this for us who are not in danger of being dragged out in the streets and pointed across and saying, that's your destination if you say you believe in Christ? How do we live this out? 
The life of discipleship is a life of self-denial. Hard-heartedness comes from we think that this world is made for us. The whole point of the gospel is that it calls the church to come and die so that we may live. If we love the things of this world, we will never be able to be conformed to the image of God. The freedom that is so clearly seen in this world is when the people of God declare that it is God who governs all things. So what fear do we have? So what do we do with all this? How do we live on purpose with this text? How do we walk this out? First, I want to talk about the problem of our sinful nature that we're constantly putting to death day by day. And it seems backwards. The call to victory is the call to die in the kingdom of God. Walking out God's plan in our lives is hard. And we recognize that it's hard. But it's hard because too often we do not actually do what God wants us to do. Too often we want what we want and we want God to deliver it for us. Part of denying yourself in submission to the holy God is to see that God wants what he wants. We must allow God to mess with our views and our desires. We must be willing to put our desires to death for the glory of God. Next, great victory happens not in great grand moments, but in tiny, seemingly insignificant moments. If you do not find joy in those seemingly tiny, insignificant moments with just you and your Bible and your prayer closet, you will not find joy in standing up for Christ during great suffering. God will always prepare you for the most difficult moments through private moments of worship. Finally, suffering is not an absence of God. What suffering does is it's God's tool to wipe the taste of the world out of your mouth, to remind you that you and I have no control in this world, that God governs all things and he is where we put our trust. And this hope causes us to strive for the glory of God in this life and the life to come. When pain comes, set your eyes on Christ who is regenerating us and who is anchoring our souls into the Father who promised us, I will never leave you nor abandon you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that victory is not found by force, but it is found by seeking and beholding the glory and the majesty of God. And God, may we be totally sold out to see your glory, not only here, but into the deepest and darkest places of the world. God, I'm reminded of Psalm 51. Teach me your ways so that I may teach those who do not know you. So, Father God, we ask you to do a mighty work in our hearts. God, may we set our eyes, may we set our mind, may we set our hearts on the things of heaven and not the things of this world. We pray this because of your Son's atoning work through the Spirit that's alive and active within us. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Scott, pastor of the Oasis Church. Listen, we are so excited that you decided to join us for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. We just pray that this will stir your affections towards Christ, but we have one encouragement we want to leave you with. Please do not allow this to take the place of the local body of believers. We pray that you will be involved in a local congregation, a local church that you can find yourself submitting under the eldership and the leadership of a local church. We pray that you will find yourself stirred towards Christ and that your joy in Christ will be ever increasing.